everyone. My name is Sumana Harihadeshwara. Thank you so much for coming to this live talk on rescuing and renewing an open source project and how to get legacy open source projects unstuck. Just so you know, I'll be taking comments in Venueless and uh, there might be about a half minute delay between me saying something and you seeing it. So uh, first I'll show you an overview of how we'll be going today. Um, first, I'll talk about who I am and who I think you are. Then I'll tell a couple of stories. Then I'll talk about how projects get stuck and how we can get them unstuck. And finally, I'll ask you to join me. So first I'll talk a little bit about who I am and who I believe you are. I am a project manager and a teacher, a trainer, and a consultant. And most of my work is with legacy software. Um, I've worked at the Wikimedia Foundation. I worked on the Python packaging ecosystem. I've worked on AutoConf. Legacy to me means that strangers depend on it enough that you have to be careful when changing it. So one question that I've had for years and that I think I've begin, begun to be able to address is how do you get a legacy open source software project unstuck? A lot of times you don't start by saying, this is the thing I want to do, right? There's a problem and you seem to be the only one who sees it. Uh, a little bit like the moment when Frodo in the Lord of the Rings sees a bunch of people arguing and says, I will take the ring though I do not know the way. Uh, I think a lot of us feel that way. Uh, I call it damn it driven leadership as in, ah, darn it, like someone's got to do this, right? And this might be you if you want to get a project unstuck, maybe expedite a release or deal with a team member that everyone else is having trouble with. Um, and maybe you depend on scores of open source applications, frameworks, and libraries. Uh, maybe one hasn't released for years or another one might be struggling with a big rewrite or a difficult maintainer. So in open source software, when the right experts have a chance to work with legacy projects, we can refresh their digital, social, and if necessary, financial and legal infrastructure so that they can thrive. Through my consulting business, I've helped GNU AutoConf, the Python Package Index, and other open source projects get unstuck over the years. And I'm going to share a couple of stories of those successes. And I'll talk about the five major places open source projects get stuck, strategy, team, interfacing, workflow, and money, and how to address each. So why don't I go ahead and move on to the stories. Uh, and the one of the most important ones, I think, is a story that's very recent which is AutoConf. So this is a story about gathering funding and about paying people for the first time. Uh, and I mean, we have probably all been concerned at various times about uh, what it does to an open source project when people start getting paid for the first time. Does this maybe discourage anyone who had been volunteering? And so there, you know, people have been talking about this since uh, 2005. Um, I would re refer you to uh, Benjamin Mako Hill's article, Problems and Strategies in Financing Voluntary Free Software Projects. And it, um, grants are one way that you can get some money on this. Um, and just like I'm not going to go into the Benjamin Mako Hill article, I'm also not going to talk too much about how to get grants for your project, because I actually gave a separate 15 minute talk about that at the Mozilla Festival, MozFest, and the video transcript and slides are all up. So I've put a link to that in Venueless. Um, but corporate funding is sometimes an option, and that is what we used with AutoConf. Um, I am going to share with you a uh, LWN piece that I wrote um, which goes into this with, uh, in a little bit of detail what we specifically did. Um, and in case you don't know, GNU AutoConf is a tool for producing configure scripts for building, installing, and packaging software on POSIX systems such as Linux. It's a core component of the GNU build system 
which uh, is also known as auto tools. When a user installs a software package on the command line by compiling it from source, they're often instructed to run dot slash configure make make install. So where does that first configure script comes from? Often it comes from autoconf. Autoconf was founded in 1991 and it progressed at a pretty, pretty steady clip uh, where people were continuing to make releases up until mid 2012. And then although development continued, uh, people just didn't have time to make releases. Finally, in uh, January 2020, someone sent this email, which I'm sharing on the screen, which says, is there someone we could pay to do a new release of the AutoConf toolset? So a colleague of mine saw this and said, hey, maybe we could. Uh, so Zach Weinberg and I sent Keith here an email um, in February and started talking about a first engagement. We talked about a discovery phase and we got some money to make basically what discovery phases in consulting are is let's make the giant to-do list of what needs doing. Uh, so we made this giant to-do list. You can actually see uh, how long this scroll bar is uh, for all the things that really would have needed doing in order to properly help AutoConf get on a, a good footing for the future in a really robust way. Uh, we were able in uh, June to, to share that. And then in July and August, Zach and I contacted some contacts, including Keith, to ask for money to at least do the first big chunk of that. And in August, we were able to get some money from Keith and also from Bloomberg and from the Free Software Foundation's new tool chain uh, funding project. So uh, this was a, a long process that, that took some money just to get started, just to figure out what needed doing. But then uh, Zach worked many hours. Uh, I worked a, a little bit, but a lot of this was on my, my friend and colleague, Zach Weinberg, who did a bunch of work in reviewing existing bug reports and patches and looking to find what patches were being carried by other distributions and so on. And finally, we were able to put out AutoConf 2.70 by the end of last year. Uh, it took a really long time uh, because it turns out that there were hidden bugs and regressions in the master branch that needed addressing. And when we one got fixed, right, another one cropped up. So this is a screenshot from Star Trek The Next Generation of an engineer scientist hopefully saying that's true, but I'm sure it's the last real problem. Um, perhaps it was not. So I want to share a few lessons about what worked here uh, and what you would do differently if you were doing this in the future. One is please look for existing contributors and funders. Look for people who are already offering money, just like Keith Bostic did, and look for people like Zach, who was, Zach was already an AutoConf contributor in the process of doing this work. He got the privilege of being a release manager as well. Gotchas. This can be slow. Watch out for fixed price engagements where you say for some number of dollars or euros, we will do this because, of course, then you're on the hook to deliver, even if it turns out to be a much bigger job um, that you still have to deliver at the same price especially if you don't already have continuous integration in place because finding and fixing regressions can be a huge time suck. As Zach said that preparation for the AutoConf 2.70 release took almost twice as long as he had anticipated. He made five beta releases between July and December 2020 and he merged 157 patches, most of them bug fixes. Next, let me talk a little bit about a time when the work that I did was really in nudging, prioritizing, and communicating. And that is with the command line tool pipenv, which is a tool that many people like to use to manage their application dependencies as developers or users. Um, and uh, since there, it's a command line tool and I don't have a good screenshot, instead I'm just using this screenshot from an old US TV ad that just says, exciting things are happening. PipEnv started several years ago. It was being released at a pretty steady clip. And then November 2018, there was a release and then releases stalled. In March 2020, I noticed, because I was already working in the world of Python packaging, that someone said, hey, since we haven't had a release for more than a year, uh, maybe we should remove PipEnv from a certain list of recommended tools. So 
I noticed this and I went into the internet relay chat channel where I knew that the main maintainer, the, the person who was putting in the most time on maintaining PipEnv uh, hung out. And I said, hey, did you notice that this is happening? Uh, he said, yeah, yeah, I, I know I need to make more progress faster on this. I said, what do you need? What do you need help with? And he said, honestly, I need someone to come ask me what I'm doing notice when I'm not on track doing something that's going to help with making the release and then nag me so that I say, okay, and I get back on track. I said, really, you would, you would listen to such a person? And he said, yeah, yeah. Uh, at first I would argue and then I would realize they were right. And then I would uh, get back on track. I said, okay. So over three months, I donated only about 15 hours of time. It wasn't that much really just coming into IRC every once in a while, nudging him. Uh, I did a little bit of pre-writing and drafting for him of here's a release checklist. Here is an announcement to the mailing list, stuff like that. I helped respond to GitHub issues a little bit. And then he did a couple of beta releases and then impossible, but true. This is also from a US TV ad. Uh, he made that release in May of 2020. And then PipEnv has had another release in June, 2020, August, 2020, November, 2020. You know, things are going okay. I was able to help get them back on a better track. So what are some lessons here? One is you can do a lot with a little, actually. I only spent 15 hours on this and the link that I put into Venulus just now gives you a little bit more detail about what it was that I did and it gives you links to the tiny bits of work product that I helped with. I, the, the only part of Pipen that I touched as uh, any kind of developer was the documentation. I never touched a line of Pipen uh, feature code. And if you can honestly complement what's missing, if you have a good relationship with those other maintainers, that can be amazing, right? Because if a maintainer can be vulnerable with you and can say, hey, here is what I need. If a person can honestly talk about their needs, that means that you can actually help them and you can accomplish a lot together. So those are just two of the case studies of times when I've been able to help get open source projects unstuck, sometimes through a bit of project management, sometimes through release management, sometimes through finance and things like that. And I've shared some other stories about other ways I've gotten projects unstuck in longer versions of this talk or other talks that I've given. So I've just put a link to my talks, conference talks page into Venulus. And I'll also be talking about these more at length in my forthcoming book. And I'll talk about that at the end. So now I'm going to move on to how projects get stuck and unstuck, but I just want to take a moment and pause in case anyone has any questions. I could possibly answer a single one right now in the, in the middle of the talk instead of wait, waiting till the end. And so you could leave that in the chat in Venulus. I see that the live stream in Venulus has just caught up to where I was. Uh, so, okay, I'm not seeing any, any questions right now. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to talking about how projects get stuck and unstuck. I would tell you that I think there are five major areas where legacy projects get stuck and they are strategy, team, interface, workflow, and money. So let me talk a little bit about what I mean by those things. When I talk about strategy, I mean, why should this project exist? And based on that, what should we be prioritizing in our work? So some ideas about how it can become stuck. If a project started to solve one person's problem and now other people with other motivations co-lead it, they often don't realize that they disagree about what's important and what's urgent. So this can lead to frustration when people have different standards on what features to work on, how fast to merge contributions, what to deprecate and when. So the strategy problem can be related to questions like, well, what work do we need to prioritize and how urgent is it? What is our goal? 
should this project exist or should we decommission it? And has the team agreed on these things? So in order to work on addressing this, anybody, this doesn't need to be an existing team lead, can check right, and assess what are the project's goals from based on what we've already said, maybe even start a conversation in case it's confused. Assess the project's health and environment and competition and check whether we're agreed about what's important, what we need to prioritize. Let me give you an example. When I was working on the Python package index, we needed to overhaul it, right? And decommission an old legacy site and bring up to production a next generation rewrite, which meant we had to make difficult decisions about what was strategically key to have at launch, right? And we decided that we did not need to be at 100% feature parity with the old site. For instance, we did not have open ID login at the moment that we launched because we decided that it was more important to ship by a particular date and be on time and on budget than to have all these other features that people had dependent on the old site, including open ID login. When I say team as an area of stuckness, the main question is who maintains this project and what do they need? This could get stuck, for instance, when one team member is so difficult to negotiate with that they block other people from coming on board and implementing important improvements uh, or conversations about important architectural changes could drag on because people aren't sure what are the decision criteria and who is going to make the final decision, who has that authority. So this is related to questions like, do we have enough maintainers to do the essential work? Do we have enough up and coming contributors who can replace the existing maintainers in the future? Uh, does everyone know who has what powers or are some people confused about who has the power to do certain things? Do we run into team workflow problems when different groups want to participate at different speeds? Is there maybe a difficult team member who needs handling? Do we have the social processes that we need to support the project and each other? Like whether that's regular meetings, mentorship programs, a request for comment process. So a task that, again, people who are not even existing maintainers can step in and help do is work to assess and understand who does what and resolve confusion, conflict, and set up ways to prevent future confusion and conflict. Let me give you an example here. When I was at the Wikimedia Foundation, Right, MediaWiki was an organic open source project that started small and then it grew. And the code review and mailing list and live chat processes weren't sufficient for discussing large architectural changes that would affect everybody developing on MediaWiki and a lot of users as well. In order to support that so that things didn't fall through the cracks or feel like they just dragged on forever, we developed a request for comment process with a regular meeting and a known decision procedure so people could understand when you want to make a small change, sure, submit that as a patch. When you want to make a big change, here is how to shepherd it through the request for comment process. When I say interface as an area of stuckness, I mean the interface of between the team and all of the people and organizations that the team needs to get information flow with. Who are our users, partners, and potential contributors, and what do they need? This issue can become stuck, for instance, if a team does not consistently listen to and communicate with groups that it's working for and with. Uh, because then that team is likely to miss important information, make the wrong decisions, and maybe lose usage and trust. Uh, so this is related to questions like, who are our partners and upstreams? Do new contributors fall through the cracks? Are we listening to them? Are we responding quickly enough to their concerns? Do they have a way of listening to us? And do we talk to each other? So a task that a person can do to help improve this area where an open source project can get stuck is to assess and identify the main stakeholders and actors and make it easier for us to listen to and talk with them about their goals, expectations, and needs. So for example, again, when I worked at the Wikimedia Foundation, MediaWiki is a web application, right, that a lot of different organizations use. Wikimedia was sort of in this dual position of both 
being the main developer of this thing that other people use, that many, many vendors and individual organizations cared about because it was a wiki application and hosting the biggest wiki, right? Wikipedia and its sibling sites. However, sometimes the people making decisions important to the future of MediaWiki wanted to hear from all the other people who cared about MediaWiki as its own code base, as its own application, but it was not easy for us to hear from them. So we hired an outreachy intern to help find those third party users and make a big list of them and help them coordinate, help them basically engage in some collective action. And now uh, that work has grown into, I believe, a, a sort of user council. Fourth, let's talk about workflow. And this is, uh, in a sense, a very simple question, right? Are your tools set up to support your work? This can, become stuck, this can become stuck, for instance, if contributors started this project years ago on an old platform that doesn't integrate conversation, patches, review, and so on. And if no one's put in the effort to integrate these things together or migrate to a platform that supports connecting all these things together, things will fall through the cracks. Or maybe sometimes people start multiple different discussion venues uh, a discourse over here, a getter over here, and a, you know maybe a new mailing list over here or a discord, and it can be tiresome to duplicate interlink engineering discussions among them. So this is going to be related to questions of tooling like, do we run automated tests on every patch? Do new issues and patches and discussions get interlinked so developers and users can easily follow up? Are there bottlenecks or duplications in the platforms that we use to respond to issues, review code, and discuss the project in general? So a thing that you can do to make progress on this and reduce how stuck a project can be on this is assess developer, contributor, and maintainer experience and upgrade tools and platforms to reduce toil for everyone. You remember that I mentioned that AutoConf does not have continuous integration yet. And Zach actually wrote up an assessment, a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats assessment of how AutoConf and, and the entire auto tools work. And he was able to call that out and explain why this was a problem and get more support for fixing that and other workflow issues. And the last stuckness I want to talk about is money. The main question, do we have the necessary plans and income to make project progress? Because this can become stuck if a team is used to working all volunteer and hasn't imagined what chunks of work could be done by hiring new contractors. Or maybe the existing team doesn't have connections to open source program officers at corporations, uh, program officers at funding agencies, and benefactors. So questions that one would want to address on this front is uh, include, do we have enough money to do what we want to do? Have we developed plans or proposals to turn money into progress? Can we persuade funders to give us money? So a person even who is not an existing maintainer or even an existing contributor can assess the current budget if there is one and assess the current roadmap, research possible funders and propose and execute funded work. Uh, and one way that we in the Python world are trying to work on this is through the Python Software Foundation's volunteer work group on project funding, which I co-founded and am a part of, uh, which tries to connect together opportunities for funding with individual projects so that people understand that this is a doable thing. So these are, you know, some, some stucknesses, as I say. So. I think that uh, what I've been able to do in order to come into a project, even when I'm not an existing maintainer or not an existing contributor, and help make change in this way, follows this basic sequence, which is you settle in, which is to say you do routine tr tasks that do not require much trust, and you assess things and you earn credibility. Then you take charge, which is to say you do things that require trust, but the group has already agreed that they need to happen. Then you make change, you modify and add social, digital, financial, and legal infrastructure. And uh, you pass the baton, which is to say that you pass leadership over to your successors and you leave. Um, and I go into a lot more detail on what one does in these steps 
in a few other talks that I've been giving recently, and I just put a link in Venue List, but I'm also going to be talking about them more at length in my forthcoming book, which I will talk about at the end. Um, and let me talk a moment about why you kind of have to do it this way, which is this, you know, imagine if you were going to hand over the keys of a project to somebody else, right? Think about what you'd be worried about if it, if it went wrong. So uh, you really need to uh, be aware of credibility as you do this. Um, one thought that I have about all this is depending on what uh, opinions you have, right? Uh, it can be useful to just make sure you keep your eye on your final goal, which is to make sure this project is humming along and being as successful as it can be by its own goals, right? And by your goals. So when questions come up that are engineering questions of architecture, code style, and which platform to use, it can be useful to remember that and focus on saying, this is blocking us, so I want to facilitate us getting this resolved. If a question comes up that has to do with your core values, of course, you know, you need to engage in that discussion. But if you can demonstrate that power and uh, winning small fights is not your goal, you're going to do a lot better. So uh, I'd like to ask you to join me and then we'll have a few minutes for questions and answers. These tools and practices, I hope, will help not just lead developers and founders, but everybody so that you know, anyone can be Frodo, right? And we can work on this a bit together. I have a, an upcoming book uh, that I am working on right now. I imagine it's probably going to come out next year, but I'm working on it. And there are some sample uh, chapters of it available right now. And I've put a link to that in Venulus. So if you subscribe to my newsletter, which only comes out a few times a year, you can get a free copy of uh, about 38 pages of that. So I would hope that you will uh, speak up in the questions and answer session uh, here in Venulus, uh, but also please contact me with your ideas, your experiences, and your thoughts. I am at changeset.nyc. So I'm just going to hang out here and uh, drink my water for a moment while I wait for any comments in the Venulus chat. Oh, I'm seeing some clap, 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 clap. So that's lovely to see. And I know uh, some of you are in Europe uh, and it is well into the evening where you are. Um, it is just about getting to be uh, 4 p.m. East Coast time. So. Uh, I recognize that for folks in Europe, you may be quite tired and you might not have anything that you need to ask or say. If you are watching this recorded, please go ahead and, and email me with your thoughts uh, and questions or feel free to follow me on Mastodon or, or Twitter. I'll just wait another minute or so in case people have any questions or thoughts they wanna share in chat. And I think it's time to go ahead and end the talk. So thank you all very much. And uh, I hope that you have a pleasant weekend. Bye-bye.